Good morning. Very, uh, very, uh, very pleased to see you all. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, colleague. Good morning, Lillian. Good morning. And good morning, everybody. We are happy to be here to listen to the SG uh, give us his uh, first 100 days achievements. Thank you. Thank you very much, too. Maybe Mr. John Bosco Kalisa can say hello as we wait for the SG to join in. Yeah. Good morning, Lillian. Good morning, everyone. I am also excited to join this, uh, this uh, meeting uh, where SG will be presenting his uh, 100 days of his achievement. So we look forward uh, from ABC to, uh, to participate in this uh, great event. Thank you very much. Uh, because of time, maybe uh, DG, you can go ahead and just uh, kick off the session. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can uh, start. Uh, I hope the SG has joined. If he hasn't, but we can start. I think this is a uh, hundred days of the SG in office. I don't know whether we are celebrating or we are we are we want to hear what has been attained or where we are going. It is a combination of everything. Uh, on the 23rd April 2021, Honorable Dr. Peter Ma Ma Mutuku Masuki was uh, inaugurated as the ESC Secretary General here in Arusha. And uh, those of you who attended physically and virtually, you recall that it was a big occasion. And Dr. Peter Masuki gave uh, a statement which uh, highlighted the vision, his vision for the community and uh, highlighted the things, the priorities he thinks should be tackled among so many priorities. And uh, this is forms the, the, the basis upon which we are going also to listen to him on what he has been able to do and where he's going to take us. Uh, I think in the, sports, in the sports world, this has been the hits and now we are going into the real race. And the real race. Well, let you know. Yeah. Yes, please. SG, have you joined? Hello? Are we Thank together? You. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yes. you. Yes, good morning. Good morning, SG, yes. SG, you are welcome. I was giving just the highlights that you, you on the 23rd, you, you were inaugurated as the Secretary General. And you made your vision very clear. And you highlighted and stated the priorities among so many priorities. And today marks, although I think that the 100 days were about two, three days ago, but I think we are celebrating it today. Uh, we, I was saying that in the world of sports, the 100 days is the heat. So the real race is going to start now so that we see how fast we can go. And this is a race that is not only for yourself, but as you stated in your, in your statement on that day, that you need everybody. I quote what you say. You said, as I leave the podium, I need help from all of you to hit the ground running. And we'll be consulting partner states, community officials, and staff 
in order to quickly fine tune some ideas that I have shared in my remarks. And I think your ideas centered around your, the vision. A great leader called Theodore M. Hesburgh said that the very essence of leadership is that you have, have a vision. You can't blow an uncertain trumpet. Another unknown quote is that leaders instill in their people a hope for success and a belief in themselves. Positive leaders empower people to accomplish their goals. I thought I should cite those quotes in respect of what you said that day and in respect of the journey that you started. I do know that you understand regional integration, but learning never stops. In the 100 days you have been with the community, you have been learned more than probably you knew before you joined the community, much as you, you had a very close relationship with the community. Probably now, you have a, a wider view of what the community entails, the challenges that are there, the realities on the ground, and the successes and achievements that probably you didn't know about. And maybe you have crafted in your, in, in your mission and objectives, how now the path to take. Chairperson, my role today is to moderate this session. It's not to make remarks, but with us, I can see we have what 214 participants in this session, which includes permanent secretaries and principal secretaries, under secretaries, we have the private sector. We have friends of the community. We have the staff of the community and uh, from all the, the whole of East Africa. We have the deputy secretaries general in attendance. And we have uh, all the, the, some citizenry who are interested in what is happening in the community. The program is going to be not so big. We'll have a brief overview of the forum, some of which I have already stated. Then we'll have remarks by the ESC Deputy Secretary General. We'll have a video documentary on the first 100 days in office. We'll have remarks by the Secretary General and we have a Q and A with the media. We are expected to take exactly one hour. We were supposed to finish at midday, but given that we're starting a little bit, we still stick within the hour that we have. So ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, I want to welcome you to this session. The ESC, you all know about it, where it started from its objectives and where it is going. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, you came in as the fifth Secretary General of the community. And you found the community had evolved over time in terms of scope, in terms of uh, uh, work in terms of development and in terms of uh, building its image at the regional, continental and international level. You came in at a time when the community was like the whole group was uh, uh, 
under the, the pandemic, which had created a fading of hope in some of the programs we were undertaking. I know that we are still faced with this challenge, but I have, I want to say as a part of the team that some hope has been created that still under these challenges, work can proceed, can go on. The forum will definitely, you will highlight where you expect, where you started from, how you have seen the 100 days and where we are going. And therefore with this brief overview, I want to welcome the two secretaries, deputy secretaries, Jen, the, the engineer Stephen Mlote to give his welcome remark, remarks. And uh, thereafter, then we will have the next item on the agenda. I don't know, I, I, I see on the agenda, engineer Stephen Mlote stroke Honorable Christopher Azvam. So I, I, I do not know who is giving the, the, the remarks or both of you are going to give the remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DG. <clears throat> Honorable ministers here present. Honorable Secretary General, Dr. Ma Masuki. Uh, DSG, Honorable DSG Bazivamo. Honorable Permanent Secretaries, distinguished uh, guests, I note that we have uh, participants from across the world. I've noted that we have participants from um, US, from um, Addis, and from many other countries beyond East Africa. So I recognize your presence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my pleasure to be with you at this landmark event that is being held at the East African community for the first time in history. We appreciate the fact that you found time out of your tight schedule to be with us for this milestone on the community's journey towards a united, a peaceful and prosperous East Africa. It is gratifying that we, it is gratifying that the attendance is as varied from partner states, ministries of ESC affairs, staff of ESC organs and institutions, development partners, diplomatic mission, private sector, civil organization, and members from the media, as I've said, and many other participants from across the world. We at the ESC feel honored by your presence in addition to your moral and material support as we embark on another leg of its journey towards an integrated East Africa. My, my expectation is that this event will reinforce all the vital linkages and relationships that have been established and in some cases uh, restored between the community and all stakeholders over the last uh, 100 days. Indeed, for the first 100 days of Honorable Dr. Mafuki, the new uh, ESC Secretary General in office, we have noted great positive changes and achievements. Honorable Dr. Mathuki started his tenure with new speed, new vigor, and new zeal. We pray that he continues with the same or more. We executives and the old staff of the ESC will continue supporting him so that the vision of the community is realized and the SG's tenure of five years bears the envisioned fruits. Once again, I welcome you all to this function of giving a brief of what has been achieved for the first 100 days of the new SG's uh, Dr. Mathuki in office. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Honorable DSG, for those remarks. Uh, 
Honorable Bazivam, you have a small remark to make? I could give you yes, an I am here. Mark, so I can proceed. So thank you, DG Bagamhunda. Honorable PSS, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And thank you for joining us for this virtual event to mark the SG's first 100 days in office. This event is timely as it is meant to set the tempo by way of benchmarking the community's achievements over the next five years when the SG will be in office. The forum is part of the ESC open door policy of engaging with all stakeholders in the spirit of transparency, good governance, and accountability. The ESC has, more than ever before, embarked on regular updates and reports on its act activities and programs to stakeholders. The gist of all this is to be accountable to our stakeholders right from the ordinary East African in the village to the summit of heads of state. It is here very important to note that awareness creation on ESC programs and projects implementation progress and key achievements is key in building ownership of the East African community integration process for ESC citizens. Performance management, teamwork, time management and value for money will therefore be key in terms of how the ESC runs its operations. This is how the current administration with the new SDG, Dr. Peter Matsuki, intends to run the East African community towards the attainment of the ESC Vision 2050. We executives call upon all stakeholders and you are equally very committed call upon all stakeholders to commit and reinforce commitment to support and be on board with the renewed spirit to speed up in a sustainable way for EAC integration agenda. So I take this opportunity to thank SG Dr. Peter Matuti for the new spirit and also to congratulate him actually for the tremendous achievement in only 100 days. So thank you and most welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, DSG Vazivam. I, I had already earlier indicated that uh, actually you uh, that you are five, but you are the six SG. And uh, I was looking at uh, the names of the the names of the previous SGs. The first one was Musaura. Second one was Mushega. The third one was Mapachu. The fourth one was Sezivera. The fifth one was Mfumkeko. The sixth one is uh, Masoki. The dominance of M. M's with the exception of one S. So that, that coincidence also maybe has a symbolism that portrays. But now we move to the next, I think that the item on the agenda, that is the, the video documentary on the SG's five first 100 days in office. IT team, please proceed.
uh, uh, new the new chairperson of the summit, President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, our new Secretary General, Dr. Peter Maduki. I, Honorable Dr. Peter Motuku Bakfuki, do you solemnly swear? Honorable Chair, I'm happy to hand over this report to my successor. The region is facing multiple challenges, some of which have whittled down the gains made by the partner states over the years on economic and social dynamics. The chief challenges, as you all know, include the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Mathuki is not new to East African Community Affairs. He served as a member of parliament of the East African Legislative Assembly from 2012 to 2017 and has been instrumental in championing removal of non-tariff barriers and activating the voice of the private sector in the EAC region integration agenda as the CEO of the East African Business Council. I firmly believe we cannot attain sustainable regional integration if partners say do not actually remove non-tariff barriers and consistently inconsistent laws that frustrate integration and investments. I think he has started off very well to try to create that sense of, of urgency and working together the way we work with the partner states. In the last 100 days, the Secretary General has focused on cultivating goodwill and creating rapport with EAC heads of state through courtesy visits while internalizing their aspirations in the integration process. Cultivating good relations with ministers of EAC affairs. I think you need to see that the direction is changing. It's already organized two dinners where he invited the, the, the Council of Ministers and also he invited the, the Speaker, but also he invited, also invited the President of the, of the Court. So we, we are working together as a team. Laying the groundwork for expansion of the East Africa community. So there was a meeting by the Presidents of East Africa, six of them, on 27th of February, and the decision was made that I should, as a Secretary General, come to DRC and launch the process of admitting DRC into the East Africa. There is a, a technical team in Kinshasa sitting with the DRC team to make sure that uh, the process is finished within eight days. After eight days, we will do a report and take it to the presidents of East Africa. They will consider the report after which they decide the admission of DRC into East African community. I have seen his commitment to work with the private sector. To say now the EAC, EABC technical working is, is officially launched. Thank, Thank you. you. He's very committed in the, uh, to fast track the open sky uh, policy liberalization, in ensuring that this region becomes a a driving uh, force uh, with regard to continental free trade area. Revitalizing relations with development partners. Dr. Peter Masuki is a man of great energy with a vision of promoting people-centered, market-oriented and private sector-led integration to make their benefits tangible for all citizens of the EAC. In the only one uh, hundred days, he uh, actually managed to restore the image of uh, the community. Resource mobilization, renewing relations with civil societies. We are going to support him in his tenure in office in making sure that East African community becomes a successful a community that unfolds the interests of people and promotes the interests of public and with the community. And incorporating the youth 
in the regional integration agenda. Improving relations among the East Africa community organs. We made two meetings, uh, heads of organs, Secretary General, Speaker of Bayana, myself. And in those meetings, we discussed the, the business of the, of the community, of our organs. Introducing a new corporate culture at the EAC Secretariat and EAC institutions where performance in service delivery is key. He has a clear future for us and he is taking us very far in these five years. We shall have a bright future and ESC integration shall see its light. Taking the integration process to the grassroots and getting it owned by the ordinary Wananchi is therefore one major challenge that we must address. He's a friendly to everyone. You are most welcome to our office as a driver. We also, we can explain our challenges. Leadership style of Honorable Maduki has been very collaborative. He brings in a fresh and new leadership style that has not been so much with us at the ESC of the past couple of years. For the only 100 days of his is already actually enough. You ask me how much I can eat yeah. To me, I can even more than so much percent. I'm the longest serving staff members. He is the sixth Secretary General who work with less support him. He will take the community higher. So that marks the end of the documentary. I think the documentary comes out clear about the, the expectations of the, all the people who are covered by the documentary in, and they look at the positive change that comes with the new leadership. And uh, allow me to quote, to make some other two quotations. One is by Mark Gorman. He says, leaders live by choice, not by accident. So, Honorable Secretary General, you are not there by accident. You are there by choice. And choice is what is expected, the expectations East Africans have in you. The second one is leadership is an action and not a position. It is not the SG ship is an action. What you are able to impact on the people of East Africa, not the office that you occupy. That was by Donald McGuddon. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, allow me now to take this uh, honor and invite the Honorable Dr. Peter Matuku Masuki, the sixth SG of East African Community, to, to give his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director General Kennedy Bagamunda, for this, the Honorable Ministers of the Personal States of the ESC in attendance the Honorable Permanent Secretaries and Principal Secretaries and the Secretaries from the partner states present, my colleagues, the Deputy Secretary Generals, Engineer Mlote and Honorable Bazvamo, Head of uh, Organs who are here, Head of Regional Economic Blocks present participating, the diplomatic calls in attendance, the friends of the East African community, the media who are here, Wanainchi, Wajumwea, Africa Mashariki. Good morning, and I'm happy to be here this morning, and indeed welcome you to this event of 100 days in office of the East African Community Secretary General. We, the public servants, have a moral responsibility to be accountable to the people we serve. In this case, the East Africans. Hence, today, I'm giving a report 
for the last 100 days of the Secretary General, which is part of this accountability to the people of East Africa. And so I let me start by first and foremost, thanking my colleagues at the East African Community Secretariat for their warm support. And of course, welcome that they accorded me since I joined the community on the 25th, April, 2021. Much of uh, the achievements and the things we're going to say today are actually attributed to them. And uh, indeed, of course, all of us as a team, and therefore, as colleagues, all of you, I salute you. I thank and appreciate the head of August of the community, the speaker of the East African Legislative Assembly, the right honorable Martin Goga, and the judge president of the East African Court of Justice, his lordship, uh, Justice uh, Ernesto Kayombera, for their commitment, and of course, for the, for the jointly agreeing to work together as a team, to serve the people of East Africa. And of course, uh, for their respective roles that we've been playing, of course, aware of the different mandates that we have, but which all aggregates towards the same vision and the same objectives of the people of East Africa. During my inauguration, as you rightly said, DG, I did some commitments, and one of them was to reach out to you as a secretariat the team spirit approach. And I'm happy today to report that the team, of, the team spirit approach has been deployed fully. And that is why in every week, every week, we have actually the meeting of the executives to review, to assess how we are moving every week. We have meetings with the head of organs that is the speaker and the judge president. We have monthly consultative meetings with the head of institutions across, and this is the culture that we've started, deliberately to ensure that we all get aligned and ensure that whatever we do across the community is indeed meant for the people of East Africa and meant to make the people of East Africa gain. I did some further commitments and one of them was to strengthen engagement with their partner states. During these 100 days, I'm happy to report and I want to thank the partner states for the warm reception that they accorded me when I did visits to the partner states that actually started on the 6th of, 6th of May. And indeed, I've been able to engage with them as ministries and of course the heads of states during the last 100 days. I started my journey by visiting, I started the Republic of Rwanda and a number of issues that came out from this. And the intention of meeting with government partner states and their heads of states was to align and understand, seek wisdom from the, from the summit members and from the partner states and the citizens of different partner states on how they would want this community to be run, on how they would expect us to do to perform. And of course, seek their support to ensure that whatever we do is aligned and at all is no confusion, but all geared towards serving the people of East Africa. And this has been done. Secondly, after one, I went to the Republic of Uganda and in the Republic of Uganda and then the Republic of South Sudan, the Republic of Burundi, the United Republic of uh, Tanzania, and uh, of course, the Republic of Kenya. Indeed, a number of issues came up from these consultations, which were very important, and that indeed this community belongs to the people. And we indeed, we need to take this community to the people so that people know what we are doing at every moment. And we also seek their views on how we want to run this community. We've been able to seek those views. And they were very important in terms of how we are supposed to engage with different uh, partner states. During the time of consultations, again, was how to strengthen the image of this and make sure that this community indeed keeps engaged and everyone should know what is happening in terms of goodwill and so forth. Again, was how to involve different stakeholders 
the private sector involvement, the civil society involvement, development partners involvement, in all that we do. And that came out strongly again from this uh, kind of engagements. And to me, this uh, gave energy to all of us in terms of how we are supposed to do. Secondly, in terms of engagement with partner states, we started quarterly consultative meetings with the ministries of responsible for East African affairs, and we've been meeting with them. We have already met with two partner states just to understand the issues and the challenges that they could be facing or the things that they would expect us to do as, as, um, as a secretariat. I'm mapping through these engagements that are very bilateral in nature, that is between the East African Communist Secretariat and the ministries of ESC, where they even involve other ministries. We are able to pick some sectoral issues, sectoral issues that are affecting different sectors. And we even receive suggestions on how we are supposed to resolve some of these problems. I want to thank them because already we are consulting and we're able to resolve most of the things bilaterally. And this will inform possibly some of these consultations will inform meetings at the council and therefore it becomes easy. And therefore this is something we've been doing. Do you think these consultations we've been doing with of course, uh, with the, the speaker of Viala, the judge president and some of my colleagues. And so we go to consult as a team so that we all get aligned and we get instructions from the people we are supposed to be working for. And therefore, during this uh, particular period, something else that we came out strongly and did was to initiate the verification mission, the DRC, during the first last hundred days, we've been able to make a visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is in line with the directive of the Heads of State Summit of the meeting held on 27 uh, February. And we initiated that uh, process. We did the launching, which the launch was officiated by the president of the DRC and a technical team comprised of very high level ranking officials uh, was able to go to Kinshasa and they were able to interact with the officials of Kinshasa and they were able to come up with a report. The report has since been drafted by those high ranking officials from partner states and this report is ready for submission to the council of ministers and the council ministers will deliberate and submit to the heads of state summit who will then consider and make a decision on the admission of the DRC uh, as, a, as a seventh member of the community. And this is something we've been able to do within the last uh, 100 days. The, we've been able, again, during the time to come out strongly and establish and even push for a coordinated approach on response to COVID. We all know COVID has become a big, it's a pandemic that is really a big challenge to the world. It came in when no one was prepared. It's a year or almost a year and a half down the line. You have seen some countries across the world, of course, getting almost access to vaccines to the tune of 70%. At the ESC, we are still uh, struggling with about 2%. And we have been actually consulting. And I'm happy to report that the partner states, all of them, have actually entered into the campaigns of on vaccination for the six partner states. And now our citizens are accessing these vaccines. We know there's a lot yet to be done to increase the number because it's through access to these COVID uh, vaccines that we are able to have the economies recover. We are able to have uh, people get back to business. We are able to attract investors and attract tourists come back to East Africa. If we don't get these vaccines, it means other people from the rest of the world will have fear visiting East Africa. And this is uh, something we are engaging with partner states and we are happy for their response. There are a number of task forces that have been put in place, a regional task force that has been actually tasked to come up with recommendations. And we are happy to report that is progressing very well. And this is something that is going to change our, our region. And the third thing that we did is, of course, in line with the commitment that we made, is the private sector agenda, private sector development. During the last 100 days, we've been able to launch a private sector technical working group. 
at the East African community. And this is a, this is a desk that will be dealing, listening, having a conversation with the private sector with the view to one, see how to create wealth for these people, see how to recover very quickly from poverty. And I'm happy to report that already they are working and there's work in progress. Tomorrow I'll be hosting the five leading business leaders from each partner state. So that together with that team, they can come up with suggestions, views, or now we need to recover from COVID, or now we need to generate enough resources to create jobs on how they can work around the table with policymakers, with governments to provide for solutions. I'm already happy to see, of course, the private sector contributing to the support on COVID. We've seen some partner states where they are giving over a million doses to support uh, this COVID uh, you know, response. And that is something very encouraging. And therefore, I'm happy to say that we've already set up this. We've already received technical assistance from development partners. We have actually experts who are helping us to develop the best strategies on how to develop the private sector in the region. At the same time, we have also met the civil society. We have created again a special desk and assigned a special officer who will be engaging with the private, with the civil society organizations. And this is in line with the treaty establishing the community, Article 128 to 129, that clearly says that we shall, we shall, using the word shall, work as a partner states, support to develop the private sector and civil society organizations. This is on in course, and already we have an officer. We've had, we received a delegation from the civil society, and we've come up with a number of things that actually uh, support uh, this uh, initiative of the private sector. In the same breath, we've been able to host the, how to involve the youth, because youth is an important component of the population of the community. We've seen them actually get out of their way to see how to help this community to create awareness on regional integration. We launched actually an initiative of a, a safari, the bicycle safari, that the young people are taking it to themselves into their hands, traveling 6,000 kilometers in the, all the ESC partner states to give, create awareness on the ESC and the need to involve the common Mwanaiji into the issues. This is an engagement we are ready to support and continue supporting. It will be an annual event and we commit to mobilize resources to continue involving the youth because the youth is basically a key cornerstone of our community. At the same time, we have revived and strengthened the inter-organ, inter-organs. Remember the community is made of different organs, three organs, number of organs, but now there is a seamless relationship between organs in terms of our work, the secretariat and the assembly, the parliament of the region. We have a working relationship on what needs to be done at what time. And out of this relationship, we have seen uh, for the first time, we had uh, an annual budget of the community passed without issues at all. And this is thanks again to the support that we've got from the organ of the East African Legislative Assembly and the leadership of the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly. And of course, the honorable members and the staff of the Assembly. We thank them. And this spirit is realizing indeed that we also have the community. At the same time, working closely with the court to understand that we need to support the court. And we have seen already court doing sessions in partner states as part of participation and putting their programs closer to the people so that we, people start realizing the importance of some of these institutions and organs of the community. We have already during the time under review, of course, you know, and it's pub in public knowledge, there were a number of issues that were facing the assembly and the members, and we were unable with the support of the assembly and indeed the council of ministers. We were able to unlock those issues. And the members of IALA now are well facilitated to work and serve with their mandate as members of the assembly. This is something that we have deliberately done to ensure that there is peace and coexistence. And I want to salute them because now 
there's harmony and they're all happy. The next thing we've been able to do for the last 100 days is the issue unlocking the issue of recruitment. We are happy again, and we want to salute the Council of Ministers, my colleagues at the Secretariat for this, because the last quite a number of years, maybe five years, we've never had a recruitment process because of a number of issues. But we've been able to resolve all these issues. And now we have agreed to proceed. The, as we speak, with the recruitment drive is in place involving all the partner states. And we are very happy that this position that you've advertised have attracted over 20, almost close to 20,000 East Africans who have shown interest. And that is to show people of East Africa are committed to serve in this community. And that is something that we really want to appreciate. And this is something that we continue encouraging that every East African has a role to play in this community. Something else we've been able to steer during the period is the initiation on the third pillar of monetary union, written to partner states to those who show interest to host the East African Monetary Institute. And this is an institute within the process of realizing the third pillar of regional integration, because we will be able now to understand, um, create a roadmap, create capacity of our institutions, and of course, the entire East African community in terms of ensuring ultimately we have a single currency. In the process now, there are a number of conversations on how to have convergence on macroeconomic you know, issues within the region and carefully try to derogate this process so that we don't face challenges. As we may have witnessed in the past in other parts of the world in financial crises. And these are things that we intend to, we intend to continue to encourage people to do. Within the last 100 days, we've been able to, to, to do to visit border points and see what is ailing. I'm happy to note that if you go to the border points like Namanga, the business has increased six times in terms of volume, movement of goods. And this is thanks again to the spirit by the heads of state themselves who are meeting and talking bilaterally to ensure that they support this process. Ourselves as a secretariat, we will continue to support this. We've made visits, we've met the border or management teams. We have encouraged them. We have created a single number, a special number, where they can be able to talk. And in case they face challenges to, to all of us at the secretariat. And therefore, this is to say we are committed to support and to resolve some of the issues that they are facing at the border points. If this is going to happen sustainably, the intra ESE trade is going to increase possibly three, four times in the next five years from currently below 15%. And that is our intention. We've also tried during the time under review, looked at some of the things that have been pending for us for some time. And one of them is the finalization of the ESC Customs Union and Management, Common External Tariff, the CET, harmonization of the Common External Tariff. We are trying to push this process to see whether we can finalize. Already we have seen partner states and it's very encouraging. They've already agreed on and adopted, of course, the, the four bank CET structure of 10%, uh, 0%, 10%, 25%. And of course, the fourth band, the fourth band. The negotiations are underway to agree and establish the fourth band is be at what point? Is it 30 or is it 35? And of course, we indeed uh, we need to conclude this by end of this year. And that is something already we are discussing with our with our with our colleagues. We are happy to note that, of course, a number of things that have happened in the community. One area network. And this is a, these are things we've been consulting when we were consulting with the partner states. And the partner states have all agreed to adopt one uh, network area where communication and calling from one country to another will be cheaper, it will be easy. That is going to make people communicate easy. It's going to make ease of doing business. 
is going to support for now people who communicate. And this is something we are looking forward to. Already the Republic of, uh, the United Republic of Tanzania have, have already indicated that they're going to have this by September. And this is a conversation we are having with them. And indeed, we encourage them to do that. And so is the Republic of Burundi, who are already committed to do that by 30th June 2022. And therefore, this adoption of one area network is going to lower the cost of communication at the intra, and that is going to increase the intra regional trade through harmonization of roaming tariffs. I'm happy to say that during the time under review, we've been able to also fast track and even extend the issue of the political confederation, which is the fourth pillar of regional integration. And during this time, uh, during this period, Already consultations are in place, consultations are, are complete with Burundi and they're complete with the Uganda. And now they'll be uh, happening in other partner states of the EEC. They're slightly being slowed by the fact that with COVID, it becomes difficult to converge in large numbers. But this is something that we are keen and be pushing so that by possibly the next uh, one year, we have conversations around political configuration, which is the fourth pillar of, of our regional integration. And therefore, this is uh, the way forward in terms of how, what we've been able to do in the last 100 days. I'm happy that, uh, of course, the ministries, the council ministries, the sectoral council ministries, the meetings that have not been able to happen for the last so many years. For example, I'll give an example, the sectoral council tourism. They've not been able to have been really able to bring them on board and they've been able to meet. And they're trying to agree on a common strategy on how to make East Africa a single destination for our tourists. And also the, the council, other councils, Council of Defense, they've been meet, they're, they're meeting and consulting on very key strategic issues that affect our community. And therefore, as we all know, each one of you in attendance and even all those who are not in attendance, have a, an obligation to this community. Let us work together. Let us make sure that we make uh, the community work for the people and for all the friends of the community. In terms of priorities, I'm happy that besides the things we are doing, we are still on course because we have said it's important that we also, as we prioritize private sector development, we also prioritize issues of peace and security in the region. This is something the, secu the Secretariat is working on, consulting with partner states, and also ensure that those countries around the community also are kept under peace, because this is what is going to make East Africa indeed a people-centered East African community. I would say these are some of the things that we've been able to do. We look forward to more, possibly in the next uh, couple of couple of days, but this is the beginning. And my assurance to the East Africans who are attending is that we are on course as we promised during our time of inauguration. I'm happy again also during the time we've been able to consult with other regional economic blocks. We are working closely together with them to make sure that we make and we realize the benefits of the African continent of free trade area. Do you think actually even this period, we, as the East African community, we've been given the mandate to chair the tripartite task force that is now comprising of the East African community, SADAC, and COMESA. And so we, as the chair of that tripartite, we have a responsibility to drive this tripartite um, arrangement towards working and realizing the full benefits of integration within the context of the East African community. So that was one of actually the initial assignments that when I came, I had to be told that I'll be the chair of that uh, task force. With my colleagues from the SADAC and my colleagues from Comesa, but I also salute them for the support that they accorded to me, that I've been able to champion that with their support. And I assure them that together we are going to work and ensure that the people of, East, of uh, Africa enjoy full benefits of integration. We may be in different regional economic blocks, but the agenda remains one, 
But at the end of it, you will have one integrated Africa that works for the people, that benefits people, that indeed Africa will be one of the leading continents in the world in terms of all the opportunities that are existing, in terms of creating jobs, in terms of creating wealth, and in terms of making that uh, this continent is a place to stay. I want to thank all of you for participating. Indeed, I'll be ready to respond to any issues or anything that I may have left. But once more, thank my colleagues at the Secretariat. It's because of them that we've been able to move this fast or this far for that matter and look forward to their continuous support going forward. I thank you. And once more, I say good afternoon. Actually, it's afternoon in Arusha, I'm sure it will be still morning in other parts of East Africa. Asante Nisan and Karibu. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General. You have yet again set the pace. Indeed, the 100 days is a litmus test of the five-year trajectory of your tenure and where you think this, the ESC should go. And I believe that all who are in attendance and those who are not in attendance will join hands with you in uh, attaining those objectives. The staff, we expect that they will fold their sleeves because business is not as usual. It's not as business as usual. We have to regain some of the lost ground in terms of getting the set objectives as, set, as uh, stipulated in the instruments. Uh, Secretary General, uh, distinguished participants, we have among us the, the right honorable speaker of the East African Legislative Assembly, Honorable Martin Ngoga, and we have also the judge president, uh, Justice Nesta Kayovera. You've demonstrated that teamwork is possible together with them. And you have clearly shown the East Africans that the organs can work in a very coordinated manner within the framework rather than having any friction. So on this, we move to the next item on the agenda and that is the two and A. And I want to hand over to Lillian and Florian uh, to moderate on this so that they can uh, uh, preside over the, 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 this whole item on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, DG Bagamohunda. Um, uh, from the communications team, we've been able to gather a couple of questions from various media houses. We've also asked all the participants, in case you have any question, kindly share it in the chat room, and we will be able to give to the relevant parties from the SG to the DSGs and DG to answer the questions that you think are relevant to the conversation today. So I'll kick off by a question from Zephania Obwani from the Citizen newspaper in Tanzania is asking Bwana SG, when you took over, you called on EAC partner states to develop a coordinated approach in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now that there's a shortage of vaccines, does the community have a joint strategy to secure these vaccines? Question number two. Following the launch of the EAC verification mission to the DRC in June, the country is inching closer to the community membership. By when will this process be finalized and what opportunities and challenges do you think that its membership will bring to the EAC? This is coming from Felix from the New Vision in Uganda. We also have a question from Rwanda. The question from Rwanda is coming from Ethan Tashobia 
Aidan Kashobia from the Rwanda TV broadcasting agency is asking, you inherited a seemingly divided EAC. What has been your greatest challenge and highlight in bringing or actually just bringing together the East Africa community? Kindly go ahead and respond to the three questions. My colleague Florian will take over the next session asking three more questions. Thank you. Okay. The, the first question was uh, on uh, COVID and this is coming from uh, Wani uh, Zephania and I want to thank you for this coordinated approach on COVID. Um, I must say that indeed, as I said in my remarks, that COVID is a big challenge to the community and indeed to the world. And um, in this place, we are trying, we are, being, we are happy to note that the partner states, all of them, they're in the program and the process of ensuring that citizens access vaccine and also testing. And this becomes a challenge. We are even, we are in a situation where we have even gone ahead to propose that we need possibly uh, a special consultative meeting by the highest organ of the community where they, they discussed specifically on how to respond to COVID. And this is something that we are pushing. We are consulting with the council of ministers and even uh, who will uh, ultimately consult and see whether they, they need to put in place a special extraordinary meeting session by the council and even by the summit to come up with a common facility within the region that will possibly try to provide for more vaccines. Because as I said, if 2% discovered, we need more vaccines. And it is possible we are not getting as much as required from the rest of the world. So we may need a local facility that generates these vaccines. So that one, we create confidence in what you're using, but also two, we try to, to make sure that as many citizens as possible uh, uh, take advantage of this. But this requires creation, awareness creation, and confidence building. Because again, we've also seen some sort of resistance coming from citizens on this, but we've been trying to encourage and create awareness and build confidence that it's important for us to recover to access to this vaccine. I'm happy that programs are rolling out. Some partner states have already gone out full to ensure that they put in place some measures where even accessing offices, you must have possibly have a COVID certificate. And this is something that we need to appreciate. The second question is on uh, DRC, joining that DRC, you know, as we speak, the population of the East Africa is already close to almost 180 million people. DRC brings on board almost close to 80 million. That means this regional economic block with the admission of DRC, it will be a population, a market population of about 300 million. And that tells you that that is a huge ground for us as East Africa. This is going to make us competitive in the world in terms of uh, how we deal with the rest of the world. We are going to see movement of services, people coming from DRC to this, and ourselves moving the other side to DRC. As we speak, the DRC business gets almost the, the consumption, the imports they get, almost that 1% they get from, from, the, from other parts of the world, actually I would say from China, and maybe from South Africa about 16%. Uh, Zambia takes 15%, but East Africa combined is only 11%. With the DRC coming on board to take advantage of the frameworks that we have, it is possible this 11% is going to make it even four times to almost take 50%. Because again, DRC will, be, DRC will be part of this family of East Africa. So I think this is something good to do. And uh, I'm happy to, to say that uh, we are looking forward to this. We leave this because the final decision on admission of any partner state is by the summit. But since that the technical team has done a good job and we have the report, we look forward to DRC joining the community. The third question you asked, it was on which one, if you don't mind. What was the third question? The third question was coming from Ethan from the Rwanda TV. Ethan is asking you, Bona SG. You inherited a seemingly divided East African community. What can you say has been your greatest challenge in bringing the community to together? What has been your biggest highlight also in 
bringing together the East African community? I would say that uh, this is a community of the people as it is in the treaty. And I don't uh, think that the community was so divided because these uh, the meetings of the summit have been happening. The Council of Ministers have been meeting and indeed a number of issues, activities have been happening. Uh, it may have been a challenge in terms of how we relate as organs, the issues of communication, but I can assure uh, in that indeed now we are on a, on, the, on a track where we bring all the organs together, starting from the summit, the council ministers, the coordinating uh, committee, the assembly, the, the court, the secretariat, and all of us working together to make sure we deliver for East Africa. The issue has been, of course, the how we communicate and how we relay information. And that's why we have started different initiatives of engaging partner states through the ministries of EEC, and we have been meeting them so that we can now try to, you know, we can now try to, to remove the gaps that have been there. And this continuous agreement will be able to resolve most of the issues that may arise in the course of discharging our duties. But I look forward to a more vibrant East African community going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary General. We have the next question from uh, Edward Quoro from the Daily News Tanzania. Uh, the question says, what is the status of comprehensive review of EAC common external tariff and its, uni its uniform application in the block? That is question number one. Question number two is on a political federation. The question says, the political federation is the ultimate goal of the EAC regional integration. Before that, common, common monetary union is also an objective. Is there any hope this will happen anytime soon? Question number three from NTV, Uganda. There have been reported hostilities between member states, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, uh, and Burundi, which, which has affected trade. How are you solving this problem? Most of, most of them is bilateral. So we can take those three first. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, where necessary, my colleagues will try to come in on the issue of the CET. As I said, is that the comprehensive review of the common external tariff uh, is progressing well. Oh, that's what I would say. And already the fact that the partner states have agreed that there'll be a fourth band. And this is expanded from the earlier three band, which was 0, 10, 25. And now they've agreed to go to the fourth band. And this is something that the team, including actually ended by Director General Vagamonda, is canvassing and trying to see how many these tariff lines can be concluded? I'm happy and he told me that uh, out of 1,448 tariff lines proposed for a rate above 25%, the partner states have agreed on 457 tariff lines. And the decision to, to finalize the review is projected. Actually, it's it hot to have been, of course, in June. But that's what we are saying. By end of this year, we look forward to having a uh, to having this, and of course, the, this will uh, will uh, will support the resolution of the persistent non barriers that hamper the intra EAC trade. And second, the issue of political confederation. I said yes. There, there is a fourth pillar, and already we've said that we are discussing with the partner states because we must sensitize the citizens. They must be. We must move along with the people of East Africa. And consultations have been happening. We have already completed the consultation with the Republic of Burundi. We have already completed the consultation with the Republic of uh, Uganda. And now we have a plan, a program, which now we go next to the United Republic of Tanzania, of course, to Rwanda and to other partner states. But I must appreciate the political goodwill coming from the heads of states. We have seen heads of states even commit more resources to support this process. And this is something that we really appreciate and look forward to conclusion. Because again, it's, it's, part, of, it's part of the journey of integrating the region. 
the third question raised by by NTV Uganda, and I think he's talking of uh, he's talking of uh, is it is it hostilities or something between the member states? And must now I want to say this. Let's look at the bigger picture and appreciate that the East African community, as it were, is rated as one of the most fastest growing regional economic bloc in Africa. And that is by, by the speed that which is growing, it is shows commitment by partner states themselves willingly saying that we want to take this commitment, this community to the next level. We have already, like, unlike other possible regional economic blocks, we already have a, we have, we have a, we have a common market. We have goodwill coming from heads of states. We have one, for example, at single ID in some partner states, you can use an identity card to move from one partner state to another. And this is going to happen in all the partner states. It's not easy in other regional economic blocks, but the fact that a citizen, a northern citizen can move from one country to another using a national ID, that is progress. We have made the efforts in having, making East Africa a single uh, tourist destination where we have a single visa you know, uh, arrangement where they can come. Uh, visitors can get a visa from any part of the world, visit uh, one country in East Africa and using the same visa go to the other. And this is something that is being discussed so that we have, we have made, uh, we have made, we made progress in this. I said about one area network where the partner states have been committed to say we need to make uh, East Africa one area network. We want to make it one area for education, for example. Honorable Bazwama will tell you this. So that we have a curricula that really covers and therefore as you get education from one partner state, you are able to use the same certificate and qualification to get a job in another partner state. And this is happening in, uh, in East Africa. So really we must appreciate that there's a good ground that has been covered However, in any setup, even at a family level, there must be issues that are always emerging time and again. But the question should be now, is there political will, good will to resolve some of the issues that emerge? And the answer is yes. Is secretariat involved in facilitating this process so that now we overcome and resolve these issues? Yes, we are in the process of doing this. We are consulting with partner states to ensure that there is seamless movement of goods across all the border points of East Africa. And I think that is a commitment that we're giving to partner states and to the citizens uh, of East Africa. And therefore, um, the challenges will always be there so long we are a community. But the issue is that how do we approach and resolve these challenges? Is there willingness? Yes. And therefore, that is, becomes our responsibility as a secretariat to devise methods and ways of, of ensuring this is done. I want to show you where you are, that yes, the community insists and we are, we are on course. Thank you. Thank you, SG. And now we move to the chat room where some of the questions that have been asked in the chat, some of them have been responded to. I'd like to acknowledge John Magok, the executive director of the Nile Youth Development Actions, your question on the African continental free trade area has been expounded by the SG. Also Dorothy Nakawesi from NMG uh, Uganda, the Nation Media Group, your question on trade and the TIF or what would be considered to be a TIF between the partner states has been responded to. So we go straight to um, Joyce Kibet, who is asking, what are the Secretary General's thoughts on an integrated preemptive response to climate change in the region? What are your thoughts, Bona SG, on an integrated preemptive response to climate change in the region? James Arusi from South Sudan Broadcasting Corporation TV is asking, Honorable SG, what is the current position of EAC in terms of equitable equitable distribution of resources in the region, especially infrastructural development and other projects. So that also can be taken up by not only USG, but it can be assisted by the DSGs and the DG. Um, uh, there's also the question from Martin Mwita from the Star newspaper in Kenya. He's asking, are there any plans to expand scopes on duty remission measures? 
and the community is keen to protect it, its industries from cheap imports from global markets, but does the cost of production, but what can we do about the cost of production in the region? So maybe SG, you can take up those with assistance from the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you rightly said, and in, in light of the spirit, I think I want to invite my colleagues to respond to this. The one of uh, integrated climate change, Honorable Banka Monda can take up this. Equitable resources and, of course, the issues of uh, infrastructure. The DSG engineer Moloto will land on this. And, of course, the cost of, uh, cost of uh, production. Again, uh, Honorable Basvamo and uh, our Bagamunda can handle this. Over to you, Bagamunda. Uh, thank you. Thank you, SG. I think on climate change, maybe we could ask uh, Honorable Zivamo to respond to it. I think ESC has had uh, some programs on climate change and uh, specific projects on addressing climate change. And at one time, we had even a uh, a high level summit on uh, climate change some years back where the heads of states attended. So maybe over to uh, DSG Vazivam. I will come back on the issue of digital remission, the cost of doing business. Thank you. Honorable Vazivam. In case, in case it's off, maybe we can have the director. Maybe chair, as we wait for them, I can also proceed on the issue of, uh, of remission measures. Please proceed. Uh, chairperson, I, 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 I understand that question or comment in the context of um, exemptions that are accorded to particularly manufacturers in regard to their inputs and raw materials, which is a scheme that we run under the ESC and also goods for the special zones, special economic zones and the export processing zones. The intent of these schemes was basically to encourage attractive investment, boost production, and uh, enhance diversification of industry so that we can uh, become a manufacturing hub as a region rather than being uh, solely a, 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 an exporter of unprocessed goods and also a sole importer of finished products. So it was intended to boost import substitution. But definitely as we evolve the dynamic environment, the growth and the changes in our production systems and in the ESC has been uh, taking place, and we realized that in the process, some of the inputs we hitherto imported as raw materials or inputs or intermediate goods have now are being produced. Some of them can be produced in the region. And in this CET review, it is not going on a stop at the CET on goods imported from outside. We are also going to review also those remission schemes and see which specific goods should now fall off the duty remission schemes. Actually, over the period, some of the items have started falling off. We are getting uh, proposals from partner states on some of the products that now can be produced in the region. And one of the criteria that the criteria we use in, uh, in determining the CET rates is availability of those products in the region or the potential to produce those goods in the region. So the, the remission schemes, yes, are going to be, they are being reviewed 
ensure that only specific critical essential raw materials can be accorded and not, not only on a permanent basis, but on a, 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 a periodically to allow, to allow review. So we are not putting permanent goods on, on the remission scheme, but as and when it is necessary. Uh, we believe that this is this incentive is is a important to the manufacturing sector, but definitely we have to be cautious of abuse because some of the the remission, some of the goods can be also finished goods in a way and can be misused. We are also looking at the duty remission regulations to make it more tight so that there is no abuse whereby people or, or there is accountability and transparency in the system. We are digitalizing our processes to ensure that the, the beneficiaries actually utilize those goods in the manufacturing process rather than using them, selling them as finished products. Uh, on the reduction of cost of doing business, it is one of the biggest objectives of the trade integration. You recall that in 2014, we commenced with the single customs territory and the whole purpose was to reduce the cost of doing business in form of clearance time, in form of documentation, in form of the border infrastructure, in form of even the corridor infrastructures. You recall that over the time, a lot of uh, checks around like way bridges have been reduced along the corridors, one-stop border posts. Now we have 13 one-stop border posts. The time that we used to take, now it has been reduced by about five, six times uh, at the borders. The turnaround period had reduced tremendously from the ports to the inland and also from inland to the ports in, in, of, in regard to exports, we had achieved a, about a 70% reduction in turn, turnaround times. Of course, the COVID has set us back on some of this and we are trying to see how we can recover on that aspect with some of the interventions we are making on easing movement, particularly of trucks and drivers. We have set up portals. We have set up interfaces and interconnectivity programs between customs and other agencies like port authorities, bureaus of standards. So all of these are intended to facilitate trade and reduce the cost of doing business. And we saw some analysis made about the cost of doing business during the implementation of the SCT, where some businesses registered tremendous decrease in costs, particularly the transport costs and other, other clearance costs. So that is our aim. That is the, the focal aspect of the trade facilitation. And uh, we look, uh, we, are, we are working more and more in terms of ensuring that the facilitation is sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Basmam, I don't know whether you are in, and if not in, we can have engineer Mulote on the equitable resources distribution. But for the climate change, so that in case Basmam is not here, I don't know whether he is joined. If not, um, you know, the heads of state direct the secretariat to come up with a policy uh, on climate change. And this uh, policy is supposed to guide, become a guideline to partner states. For well, now, we are supposed to, of course, mitigate the adverse effects of climate change. And also, this we also within the documentation of this come up with a master plan of uh, master plan on uh, how to, to 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 deal with the climate change issues. And um, the we look at the vision of the of this of the of the master plan called the master plan vision for the climate change. 
it is the people, it is the, the, our economies, it is our ecosystems. It's the people, our economies, ecosystems. And this is going to accord our partner states uh, within the region and advance and get to know what they're supposed to do. So that again, of course, our lives, the lives of citizens don't get adversely affected by, by this. So already we are putting mechanisms, we are, de we are developing instruments that are going to support that this in line with, of course, the sustainable development, which I think is critical for, for the region. Uh, the other issue was about equitable resources but on infrastructure, engineer Malote. Equitable sharing of benefits to the EAC partner states. Yeah. The Secretariat is very keen on this. Uh, that uh, there is uh, that, that there is equitable sharing, and uh, with regard to infrastructure, which is an important uh, integral uh, uh, part of the trading, because infrastructure facilitates trade and the movement of goods and persons. Uh, we collaborate with the partner states in uh, planning of all the projects we undertake of all the infrastructure projects we understand. And uh, uh, we, 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 we at the community in support with the development partners, we are working hard to make sure that we connect all the capitals, we, all the ESC capitals with the tarmac roads so that uh, 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 goods can move, can move across the region uh, very easily. For example, uh, we connect uh, Kampala with the uh, uh, Dar es Salaam by Tamak Road through Mutukula, uh, Kigali with the Kampala through several roads coming from east of Kigali. Uh, Kigali with the Tanzania also we connect through Rusumo. Burundi, uh, Bujumbura with the Tanzania we connect through uh, Manyovu Mugina. Kenya with the Tanzania is connected through Orohoro Lungarunga. And we have a very uh, big project of about 400 kilometers of road from Malindi through Mombasa to Horohoro Lungalunga through uh, uh, Tanga to Bagamoyo. And also we have now a fast track roadmap to make sure that uh, access uh, uh, is fully integrated to the community. Into consideration that RSS was uh, recently to the East African community. So we have a fast track a roadmap to make sure that uh, uh, there is a preferential uh, uh, way that uh, the Republic of South Sudan is fast tracked in terms of integrating it to, to the community. Similarly, for the projects, we are now planning for one stop border posts, one stop border posts between uh, Uganda in the South Sudan, between Kenya and the South Sudan, and also those tarmac, those roads which connect the capitals will also be uh, put into tarmac. The same will be done when, uh, when uh, DRC joins the community. We'll develop a fast track a roadmap to make sure that it is uh, quickly integrated to the community so that uh, East Africans can trade very easily with these new a partner states joining the community. Thank you. Lydian, do we still have any more or we should be closing now? Yes, we, yes this is Florian. We have two questions because of time. I think we are going to wind up from here. We have two questions, one from Eliwood from Standard Kenya. <clears throat> Eliwood is asking, in March 20, in March 20, uh, 2011, no, 2012, Somalia applied to join EAC. However, the dream was cut short after its bid was rejected for failing to meet the e eligibility criteria. What does Somalia need to do for it to be considered membership? That's question number one from Eliwood, Standard Kenya. Question number two, this last question, 
Hili Kiswahili uh, your ex uh, secretary general this is uh, Swahili question inatoka uh, nipashe nipashe kutoka Tanzania anaitwa Fredrick yeye anauliza na ameomba kujibiwa kwa Kiswahili anasema ziala ya rais wa Tanzania mama Samia Sulu Hassan kwa nchi za jumuiya Afrika Mashariki ina maana gani kwa jumuiya those are the two questions sg one from the standard newspaper in Kenya and another one from uh, Tanzania Nipashe thank you so much asante sana naomba nianze na Nipashe kweli cha kwanza zaidi sana ni kumpongeza mheshimiwa rais Samia Sulu Hassan kama mama yetu wa jumuiya tunampenda sababu ndiye mama rais katika jumuiya na tumeona kweli ameanza vizuri kwa safari na ziara zake kwa nchi zote za jumuiya Afrika Mashariki kujaribu kuleta uhiano na kuleta wananchi na nchi zote za jumuiya pamoja na hiyo tunampa hapo na tunampa ongera sana na tunamuomba endelee hivyo hivyo sababu hiyo itafanya nchi zote za jumuiya kuanza kuongea kwa karibu na kuona kwa pamoja ni vipi watatatua zile changamoto tuko nazo lakini naona cha kwamba cha kwanza muhimu zaidi ukiona ziara zake vile ame, ameanza safari zake uh, inaonekana kwa ajenda yake kuna aspect ya economic diplomacy na hiyo ni kuona ni vipi sasa tutapata nafasi ikiwa na wafanyabiashara katika kutoka kwa katika nchi ya Tanzania watapata nafasi kufanya uwekezaji katika nchi zingine katika jumuiya na pia kuwakaribisha wanabiashara kutoka hizi nchi zingine za jumuiya kuja kufanya uwekezaji Tanzania. Uwekezaji utaleta faida nyingi tu kwanza cha kwanza utaleta ajira kwa vijana. Na hiyo ni wanjenda kubwa sana. Wakati tulikutana na mama Samia Mheshimiwa Rais Samia alitolea kwamba ajenda ya vijana lazima tuipewe nafasi kwa mbele ndio vijana wapate ajira. Na tunaona hiyo ni kuona ni vipi ataleta wawekezaji wana biashara waje hapa Tanzania waweke wafanye wawekezaji lakini pia vijana wetu wapate nafasi za, za kazi cha pili itaongeza mapato kwa nchi sababu wengi watu watakuja kufanya ile inaitwa foreign direct investment na nchi ya Tanzania itakuwa sasa itaanza kuwa na, na mapato ya juu eh, sekta tofauti cha tatu ni kusema basi Tanzania ni nchi wazi kama nchi moja anzilisha ya jumuiya Afrika Mashariki imefunguliwa wazi kwa wananchi wote wa jumuiya Afrika Mashariki na hiyo ndiyo tunaona ni vile anasema kwa kwa sisi wote na kwa wananchi wote na hiyo kweli ni encouragement kwa sisi wote na tunaomba wengine wote tu sisi wananchi wote tu, tukubali na tuchukue nafasi na tuone kwa pamoja ni vipi tutachukua hiyo uh, hiyo nafasi ya pili the second one is on the issue of somalia application to join the usc indeed a decision again was made by the heads of state because it is that organ of heads of states who have that authority to admit a foreign country into the usc and of course there's been a number of initiatives that have been done and obviously once a decision is made by the summit it becomes a duty of the secretariat to fast track the process in consultation with the council of ministers and as we did that we've been following up with the with the republic of somalia on a number of issues on on their admission and of course before even the verification mission it is always advised that we do visit as a secretariat to have some informal initial discussions with them and see how the level of preparedness and the following the the that uh the secretariat we wrote to the to the republic of somalia uh on a proposal so, to visit uh, somalia as a secretariat and the purpose of the visit was to see how we can uh, engage them and see how we can resolve and uh, for that i can say we've been using of course their missions in the partner states just to see what is the best time to meet to meet them and discuss and uh, we can confirm that that conversation and communication 
between ourselves and the Republic of Somalia is in the progress, is in place, is happening. We are using all diplomatic channels, which uh, will allow us to have that initial discussion and have a conclusion. Of course, once they are ready in terms of all the departments that are relevant, then we shall be able to meet and see how we can start that conversation. The decision by the heads of state summit of the EAC that shows again commitment from this side. But again, both sides must be must be uh, must be ready. And you know, once they are ready, they will be able to start that. So we are in constant touch with the authorities through diplomatic channels to ensure that we bring them on board. I thank you. Thank you, Bona SG. Uh, as we conclude, I'd like to appreciate each and everyone who's taken their time to share questions and comments on the chat room. I'd like to just start by pointing out that we have a lot of uh, compliments from uh, GIZ. We have Thomas Walter, who is also appreciating and saluting you, Bona SG. Uh, for the partnership. And also we have uh, comments from uh, Mr. John Bosco Kalisa from the East African Business Council. We also have from the IUCEA. We also have comments and compliments coming from uh, Philip Ogola, founder Digital Humanitarian, joining in from Michigan, USA. We cannot have, uh, we do not have the time to go through and respond to the questions in this forum, but what we will do as the communication team is to consolidate the questions, consult the executives and the experts in the particular field, and we will be sharing a comprehensive responses on our website. Thank you. Back to you, Buonadigi. Yeah, for the, you, thank you. Sorry, Allow me just yes, before yes, the, yes. Yeah, before DG, let me uh, as a way of uh, standing out and uh, singling out the role the development partners have partnered with this. I want to salute you. We've had, of course, the GIZ of being friends of the community. We thank you for the partnership and support that you've continued. We've had the European Union uh, who have been consistent, even giving some technical support. We have, of course, the trademark, we have all the partners, and it is through you as our friends, our development partners, that we want to continue working with you so that we can have a win-win in terms of how we want to take this community forward. This will be possible with your participation, with your continuous support, a support that is deliberate to support this community so that it becomes you know, responsive to the issues raised and serving the people of East Africa. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I hear SG Bazivam has something to say. Yes, thank you, DG Bagamonda. Thank you, SG. I think uh, I, there was a question on climate change and I apologize because I had, I was off because of uh, connection. And I wish to highlight the fact that at ESC, you understand fully the challenges with uh, climate change and it is real. You have been witnessing impact and serious impact from this uh, climate change. And we adopt from a long time actually, have been being implementing measures around mitigation of climate change and also measures to build the kind of resilience uh, in our community. At the ESC level under environment, we have uh, developed original biodiversity strategy and action plan, and some projects are under, under implementation. We have also a protocol on environment and natural resources management, which is uh, in the process of ratification. And all of this is to have original coordinated approach when it comes to mitigating these uh, uh, issues around climate change. We have developed a strategy for management and conservation of arid and semi-arid areas. And we have also uh, now actually approved by the Secretary Council on uh, forest, uh, on uh, um, environment, on ESC forest policy and strategy in the process of being adopted finally by the Council of Ministers. And you have been dealing with UN, FCCC, Secretariat to come up with some actual activities also on the ground uh, towards mitigating this uh, issue of climate change. 
We have also in the framework developed an integrated approach when it comes to environmental protection for sustainable social economic uh, development, which is a program for all partner states to deal with uh, landscape, uh, especially uh, degraded landscape to restore them. And in this framework, we shall be installing actually areas where we, it needs to be reforested, areas where uh, uh, agriculture activities have to be uh, uh, improved. All of these are in the framework of having a coordinated approach and also regional programs in the framework of building resilience and also mitigating the concerns we have uh, on climate change. And you know, in the whole world, it is a concern, even if we know that uh, uh, internationally, the responses are very, uh, uh, very, very uh, low. And we have to keep on mobilizing. And you know, we have had uh, recently on environmental to week in Dodoma. All of these ideas is to try to build our own uh, uh, approaches and to have uh, solutions which can be called homegrown solutions to address the challenges. But the most important thing is to build resilience and to ensure everyone is on board and understand uh, the challenges and how to address them. Thank you. Th thank you, DSG Bazivamu, for the highlight and response on climate change. I think we are coming to the conclusion of this uh, engagement. Uh, our experience now with the virtual meetings is that the shorter they are, the better. You need to keep the people with an appetite. It is like a dessert so that they create more appetite for the main meal. And uh, therefore we expect more engagement. I think this is a learning point that only shouldn't we, we shouldn't celebrate the 100 days, but we should also have period, periodical engagement, update the East Africans on what we are doing. Uh, sometimes they say it's better even to blow your own trumpet. I think ESC has been not very good at showcasing what it is doing. I think it is high time that we showcase and we let East Africans understand and know. So I want to thank everybody who has participated in this engagement. We, we feel this is a, this is a, indeed a, a very important uh, engagement. We look forward to engaging with you more. We will, we will be updating you. So on that note, I want to thank the SG for the highlights, for the statement, for the responses. And then we will be having this documentary on YouTube. So it will be accessed from the ESC website and also some of the chat, what is in the chat room as has been indicated will be responded to through, through the, our media platforms. And uh, I thank you all. I wish you all the best. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. 270 is not a small number. I would like to appreciate each and every one of you. The East African community belongs to all of us, and we therefore have a responsibility to ensure a prosperous region. I'd like to just say that this is the beginning, and I trust uh, with your support and cooperation, we will be able to steer the community yeah, forward. The community Thank you very forward. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, police. Thank you.